So we ended on what? Constantine. And then I shared the positive reforms that come with the emperor being leader of the Christian church, which then to those who were persecuted, they saw like it was a miracle that had taken place because they were from the underground and now they are being celebrated and their leader, a Christian, is sitting in the highest position of office. What a glory it was. But yet also, on the other hand, like I said, it had its misgivings. One of them was that um, that was too much power on a man. Okay? The local church has, I believe, its order system running. If there's anything above the local church, then it's only to the accountability of that local church to an individual according to the ordination of God, but not according to the ordination of the state and Roman system. Okay? Too much power um, corrupts. When it becomes too much and it's kernel, and like it was during that time, there was a mixture of Rome and the church, that power was too much for one man. And you'll agree later as we continue to see. I'll give you an example. Presently, the Catholic Church is 1.2 billion people, and they're all under one man who is so old and he can't run. No offense, okay? I don't think that he has enough grace to run everything. And that's the truth. But it comes with too much. That is Rome, Rome and its own system. Praise God. And sadly also, I must add that um, that is what transitions in the formation in that period of imperial Christianity is when we find what you and I call the Roman Catholic Church. What were universal became Roman Catholic. Why? Because step by step, the Catholic Church started to transition and submit itself uh, to the patterns and the principles and systems of Rome. And newsflash, world religions, the major world religions of the world have all factions and fashioned themselves as their own. Then Muhammad later comes and then he gets a revelation, I will explain that a bit later. You realize that when he starts to build Islam, is, Islam is built on the system and structure of Rome. When later uh, Henry is building the Anglican Church in England, you will see that the Anglican Church in England is built on the structure and the system of Rome. And so before you know that, they have many things alike. Okay? Like you have rosaries in the Roman Catholic, the Muslims have ro rosaries too. Do you understand? Like they burn incense in the Roman Catholic, the Muslims burn incense too. There is many things in similar in how things are. Like, like the sacred scriptures are only left to, most importantly, those that have qualified to be trained, like the sheikhs who have done Sharia as a degree, like the, like laymen are not allowed to preach in the Anglican church, like laymen are not allowed to preach in the Roman Catholic church. It's the same principle. It's the same thing. These things have not changed. So world religions have fashioned themselves after Rome. And guess what? Rome fell. And Latin is not spoken. What does that mean? That anybody or anything that fashions itself after the patterns of Rome will consequently fall like Rome fell. Praise God. Now here is the question. The Muslim is Mecca. The Catholic is Rome. The Anglican is England. Well, who is the born again believer? The Pentecostal tongue speaking. You don't have any bearing. Right? It's a good and bad. It's a good because that means you are not yet yet fully sunk into the Roman system. But it's a bad that many of you, or many people in the Pentecostal and born again fraternity movement, do not know what to follow. Because they don't, many of them don't have a pattern. And so consequently you find that almost 80% of our usual worship, even in the born again and Pentecostal movements, uh, we find that many of us have embraced Rome without even knowing it. When I saw these things many years ago, I defined and determined to build my ministry far from Rome. And that is why one of the major reasons why Fanero is growing at a speed that is unpredictable. So endure the persecution. <laughs> Praise God. We must know how to build. Praise God. We must know how to what? How to build. We must know how to build. 
They say 80% of the churches in the world are below 200 members. You know why? Many of them, if you go in their foundation, what killed Rome is killing them and they don't even know because they think that the gift builds the ministry. Gifts create room. They don't sustain and expand that room. You must know how to build. Those of you who one day, and I believe some of you are going to become pastors and preachers like me. Praise God. Somebody shout hallelujah. hallelujah. The other thing also, um, the capital was moved from Rome to Constantinople. Originally Constantinople was called Byzantine. And then he changed its name to Constantinople. Later the Turks took over years later, which is now present day Istanbul, the capital of Turkey. Istanbul, Turkey was Constantinople, was Byzantine. Okay? And now saying that I've shifted the capital from Rome as we know it, yet I'm the emperor and it's at Constantinople, you've created a great division again somehow in the understanding of the church because certain men had built certain things within Rome and were starting to build things. Why did he put it at Constantinople? Because many of the enemies of Rome came from that direction. So he needed to go and establish cities there and an army there to fortify it such that it was harder uh, to attack than it was before. That now brought another division within the church and the western group of Rome called itself the Roman Catholic Church the eastern group of Constantinople now starts to have this which you call the Orthodox. Yeah, they come from that. Same system, same structure and everything, but they feel that the way Rome runs some things, they have a few disagreements in some things, and so that's how the Orthodox movement is. And consequently, a few uh, dissensions as well happen there. And then, church, from because of that, Christianity uh, lost its identity. Why? In that period, remember, like I told you, we get to a place where even some emperors are like, if you don't believe, you're dead. So some people become Christians, and many people start to define different ideas about Christianity. So we see the, 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 the rise of new sects, cults, and movements that were misdirected, each one going with its own revelation and vision of who God was. And that also brought a very big mayhem on the church of Jesus Christ because Christians started to look like Eastern religions. You understand? Remember, they're all functioning after Rome. And what is Rome? Greek philosophy, Greek mythology, Egyptian mythology, and Persian Zoroaster gods. That's the foundation of what you call the Roman Empire. So consequently, even without knowing, you find yourselves worshipping things that you don't understand. You give yourself to things that don't make sense and then they are embedded in systems. That's why up to now, we're still struggling with things that are not revelational, and some of us don't know where they came from. For example, some of you celebrate Easter. Easter was a story, the Anglo-Saxon goddess of fertility, and she was celebrated in the same time of the Passover all through to the Resurrection Sunday. So by the time the Gospel comes, and then they realize it's in the same time when the goddess's story is worshipped. Of course, some of them were like, should we... Uh, adopt the Resurrection Sunday a celebration? No. The Anglo-Saxons said no. We insist that we should keep our original story and that's now such what some of you call Happy Easter. <laughs> oh God. But if you go through the artifacts, you'll see there's something wrong. You have Easter bunnies and eggs. The sacrifice, the, the worship of the story also involved eggs and rabbits and these were representation of um, fertility. So if you go studying, you're going to realize there are many things many people do in church. They don't even have the meaning of them. They don't even know why they do them, but they do them. Do I believe in Easter? No. I believe in Resurrection Sunday. I believe in Good Friday. I believe in, in the death and resurrection of our Lord and Savior. I believe in the Resurrection Sunday, but I don't believe in Easter. Praise God. So next time when you are talking to your friends, you don't tell them happy Easter, you tell them happy resurrection weekend. <laughs> Praise God. But many things creep in and away, and before we know that we are many things, and then again a story is given of that time, and how now even when money comes through, why? Because the way church is being built, eh? church is amassing a lot of power, but the power is through dirty means of gaining power and money, right? Remember? Uh, acts of penance, indulgences. If you have done this, what have you done? I've killed a person. How many properties do you have? I have two of them. 
give those two and then go say five Hail Marys, you'll be forgiven. And then you give those two to the Roman Catholic Church and the Roman Catholic Church builds cathedrals. <laughs> Praise God. So power then shifted from the anointing and the demonstration of the Holy Spirit to stay in the hearts of your ears, the most holy emotions and that's persuading them. Power now starts to shift into political influence and money. How much money did a man have? How much political connections did a man have? So if you're a man of God, the first thing you have to do is you have to sway with the high and mighty, the political in office, the measures you can call and they fix you when the police get you on the road. Or on the other hand, you also have to have to amass a lot of money. And the church starts to look like a money minting business. Sad, but it is true. And some of those things have again carried through into the church and that's why I tell people it is so sad because then gold and silver was a must. Consequent emperors took it to another level. Later on as I share when they get armies they would even send their armies to loot gold and silver and kill men for riches and they were told those were enemies of the gospel and the wealth of the wicked they stored up for the just kill them and tell their gold. I mean some popes later when we start talking about the papacy you see it was taken so far. And so some of these religious people they have a lot of money. They say the Roman Catholic Church has enough money to run its programs for 300 years without anything coming in. That's how much they have. Who knows how much the Pope earns per year? 200 million dollars to be the Pope. I don't know what it does with it. Back to the story. So we start to see experiences of um, power, political power and money. The anointing starts to leave. The presence starts to depart. And then men become more cold but rich and more politically influential. The sects and cults and movements have increased. And then a story is told of how they build wonderful buildings, but they don't have architectural pictures as Christians. So what do they do? They borrow Persian Zoroaster architecture. Many of the buildings of the first, second, and third century. I mean, the third, fourth, no, the fourth, fifth, sixth century of church. Many of them, when you start looking at them, they are Persian Zoroaster. They are they are like pagan shrines, and then they fill them with gold. And in fact, one story is spoken of or two clergymen that were walking in a very magnificent building and then one guy is walking with his friend and then he looks up and then he sees the beauty and the grandeur of splendor that was in our cathedral and he tells him my friend no longer can we say like saint peter that silver and gold have i not <laughs> then his friend told him but neither can we say get up in the name of jesus and walk <laughs> you know that was a very fundamental reality of what explains imperial Christianity. The church had gained too much power imperially, but had lost the anointing that made them who they were, truly children of God with the effect that they must have. Somebody say, Amen. Amen. So, of course, that split brought a lot of uh, challenges. And um, the church is divided west and east. And then consequently, now, like what was in Rome, the Orthodox people also need to establish themselves a bit further because heresies are coming through and we are seeing a few evils the other side. We need some stability this side on the side. Rome was a bit corrupt already. The people in Orthodox, the Orthodox of Constantinople, they started to see some of these things and so they wanted to separate themselves from the Roman Catholic. Okay? And so consequently, like it began in the Catholic Christianity of 70 AD through 300, 12, where they start to formulate truth and Jesus. Again, now the Orthodox are back to beginning. What is truth? Who is Jesus? What do we believe? Why don't we believe? Because then we start to see that many people are coming through with many different revelations. And us as the Orthodox are not ready to believe and go with everything Rome was teaching. Consequently, many of these things were contradictory. Now, a very interesting guy was a bishop, Arius of Egypt. He comes up with a concept during that time that tickles <laughs> these guys very badly. He says, Jesus was not God but a created being similar to God. <laughs> he was a created being, not God, similar to God. Not one with God, but similar to God. You understand? 
there's a problem. And now the fathers have to come. What's, what's happening? Because these were fundamental things in defining what do we believe. We are no longer defining, you know, some of the things that have been defined earlier about Jesus. We believe all of that, but now we've gone into another level of understanding him. Who was he by nature? You understand? Was he one with God? And then consequently, in 325 AD, the Athanasian Creed was written. It is longer than the words I'm going to read, but the Athanasian Creed was what? Was written to counter that. These things haven't left. That's how Jehovah's Witnesses believe. They believe Jesus was a created being similar to God, but not one with God. You go read the Jehovah's Witness doctrine. You'll be amazed that they still believe. Hallelujah. And so, I'm going to borrow one of the lines that is spoken there in the Athanasian Creed 325 AD. And he says, and the universal faith is this, that we worship one God in Trinity, and Trinity in unity, neither confusing the persons nor dividing the essence for there is one person of the father another of the son and another of the holy spirit but the godhead of the father of the son and the holy spirit is all one the glory equal the majesty co-eternal such as is the father such is the son and such is the holy spirit the father is uncreated the son is uncreated and the holy spirit is uncreated they needed to bring sanity the father the son and the spirit are one Praise God. And then later another crazy fellow comes up, Apollon Apollonarius, 380 AD, in that same period. He gets a revelation that Jesus was a God in a body, but he didn't have a human mind and soul. Right? He didn't have a human mind and what? Then another fellow, if you think that one is strange, there's another one. Nestorius said, Jesus was fully man and fully God, but his human nature didn't interact with his God nature. No. How? You understand? Even me, I'm asking. So you're fully God, fully man, and these two are disconnected, and somehow you're functioning normal? It's like saying that your soul and your body are disconnected, but they are all working. How does that work? And then that's what brings the 451 AD Chalcedonian creed. It's important for you to know these creeds because many of them are still relevant to this day. And it says, following them the Holy Fathers, again as they sat, again I want you to know that these things were solved by the Fathers then. Either the ones before the Nisan Fathers were called Antenathan and the ones in the Nisan days and consequently are the Nisan Fathers. But they used to get them together and they said, let's discuss this. And then that, what is agreed? according to the debates that are held is what is, is given through as fundamental. And then it says, following then that the Holy Fathers, we all unanimously teach that our Lord Jesus Christ is to us one and the same Son, the self-same perfect in Godhead, the self-same perfect in manhood, truly God and truly man, the self-same of a rational soul and body. So he's also coexistential with the Father according to the Godhead, the self-same coexistential with us according to the manhood like us in all things seen apart we say he is not a sinner though before the ages begotten of the father as to the godhead but in the last days the self sent for us and for our salvation born of mary as to the manhood one and the same christ son lord only begotten acknowledged in two nature natures and confusedly unchangeably indivisibly inseparably they acknowledged in two natures that same jesus he is He's acknowledging those two. You can't confuse him, they say. You can't what? Change it. You can't separate him. Praise God. And then it continues on and on and on, stretching, stressing who Jesus is. And these are the things that kept sanity in the church. Imagine a situation where, for example, we have an idea to discuss in church. For example, marriage. And then they call the fathers in the country. <laughs> and then they define for us what marriage is. Right? And then that passes in the nation that this is the standard of how you marry, how you divorce, how you relate, how you love, how you date. Those were sobering days. God bring them back. Somebody thought hallelujah. But they were important because you see, and, and that's the challenge when the church starts to disconnect from the fathering spirit because it was abused. Seriously, you may find some people not using such names because they were grossly abused. 
some people became gods. Yes, it's, it's, it's sad. But we have people who have gone ahead of us. Praise God. And we give honor to whom honor is due. Somebody shout hallelujah. Another interesting group also ensues during that time. It sees the evils of the dates confused by the corruption of modern society then. And then it says, you know what? We want to detach ourselves from this evil. And then that is the birth of what they call the hermits and the monasteries. Hermits, H-E-R-M-I-T-E-S, and the monasteries. Difference between the hermits and the monasteries, the hermits, the hermits dwelt in deserts. Eh? The Latin word hermit means desert. And the monasteries, who are the monks, they used to separate themselves and build, either live in caves, or if not caves, some of them later developed cities and separated themselves and built cities of God one way and then separated themselves from the evil that was in the world. And a very interesting line was there. Praise God. Those guys are also key in the history of the church because later when the dark ages come through and emperors and kings make up to destroy everything we know in the artifacts of Christian history, these are the guys that keep the sacred text. So we thank God for them. But they were a bit what extreme because some of them again in there you'd find that they held some things. They, they were, there were some things in the Roman Catholic that one, we, you and I might not be agreeable today, but some of the things they really separated themselves and they also played some. But there's a certain Hamite, this guy is called Saint Jerome. Saint Jerome, you know, he was a guy, was raised a hermit, went into the deserts to separate himself, but he had a problem. He had a very crazy sexual drive. He couldn't control his what? His sexual drive. So he goes to the desert and the sexual drive continues, but he's believing God, you know. And then he separates himself. Then, I don't know, some people say it was inspiration or leading. He felt that there was something he could do to, to, to curb his sexual drive. So he started studying what? Hebrew. So this guy started to study Hebrew. But they say in history that it helped his body. He testifies that when he, by the time he began to speak Hebrew, his body was in control. So, study. <laughs> That's a joke. <laughs> but for him it worked. So anyway, he makes the first literal translation we know from the Hebrew and Greek, all of the Hebrew and Greek of the present, of the Bible then, the word then, the scriptures, available scriptures then, into Latin, in what we call the Latin Vulgate, which is the oldest and most notable translation used in the Roman Catholic Church. And I believe up to today, many of them still use that fellow's works. Now, there was a monk called Augustine of Hippo. Augustine of Hippo, St. Augustine of Hippo. I needed to pull out this guy because it's important for you to get to know him. 354 to 430 AD. Augustine of Hippo was the first fellow we read of in church history after the cross as someone who truly understood, pulled out the basic lines of grace, God's sovereignty, um, the dispensation of righteousness imputed, the depravity of man, the original sin, the grace message. That guy, if you go read his works, you will be amazed that that guy got the grace message very early. What am I trying to tell you? Grace message is not a new revelation. It's old. But it had lost, it had been lost somewhere in the corridors of history. This guy started to get that revelation. In fact, Martin Luther is quoted for having quoted that man more than a hundred times. Calvin quoted Augustine. So he's a special man in history. Why? Because he opens the door of the Bible school that you're in and the gospel that I'm preaching. You don't take it lightly. Praise God. So whatever you see as the grace, Augustine was the first fellow in history we see with a record of that. It was a special experience. Somebody shout hallelujah. hallelujah. Also in imperial Christianity, the missions continue. Right? The missions continue. And that's the time the missions go most into the barbarian 
tribes. Barbarian, for your English, would be a strange fellow, misunderstood guy. But back in the day, barbarian meant people from England, the British, the Irish, the German, the French, the Scottish, the Norwegians, the Swedish, and people from Holland. <laughs> Any tall fellows, blue eyes, you know, they were called barbarians. And they were the biggest threat to Europe. Those guys used to conquer everything. They never used to want to know. The biggest wars of conquer with those guys. They are the same blood and the same people. Praise God. And in fact, later I met a guy called Attila the Han. I remember the Hans Buxton. <laughs> I laughed. <laughs> you know. But they are people of conquer. They are, they are fighters of war. They are men of war. They are very strong fellows, as you can see. They are big guys. They are not small like, you know, our fellows, you know. <laughs> but the, they say through the ages of imperial Christianity the gospel went most into those areas. And now we start to see slowly by slowly the idea and concept of the papacy is coming. We are now approaching 490 something into 500 and what? Uh, 90 AD. Now the issue of the papacy starts to come through. We start to smell the rumblings of this whole idea you and I call papacy. Where does it begin from? Rome is trying to establish itself as a strength, of course. It's popular and not popular. Sometimes it is, sometimes it's not. The emperors are there, it's true. Wars are being fought, that's true. But sometimes it is popular and sometimes it's not popular. Sometimes the emperors are there and sometimes uh, they don't have as much control over the kingdom. Some of the kingdoms are becoming bigger and stronger for them. Later on you will see. Some of the kingdoms become bigger for them. But during that time when, 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 when Europe is open up, partly the gospel is being preached right and wrong, it doesn't matter then, but it was there. Now one fellow called Damasus, the first, he was a bishop of Rome. This guy gets a revelation in Matthew 16, 18, and he actually says, no, this rock eh, on which God said he'll build his church was Rome, because Peter died in Rome, <laughs> and they claim him to be the first pope. Now, I have had even believers, men of God say Peter was the first pope, but I don't understand what they mean. I don't understand what they mean what they mean by Peter was the first pope. I hear men of God say it, but I think it also depends on the Bible schools they went to. What makes Peter, Peter the first pope? Right? You go to the Bible, there is no history actually that shows us that the fellow was in Rome. If he was, what we could pick in the earliest history accounts, he went through Rome. But we do not really have enough proof in history to prove that he was actually crucified in Rome and indeed was the first pope. Praise God. So anyway, um, he says, I am, the rock is wrong. And he says, and I believe that the Pope should be the head of the church. Of course, they didn't take him serious. They didn't take Damasus serious. Until later, another fellow called Leo the Great comes through after him. Leo the Great also becomes Pope. He takes Damasus, his claim father, and then he says, I am the rightful heir of Peter. How? You don't ask how. It is so. It was by revelation or whatever it was, but it was so. And ladies and gentlemen, these things you cannot debate. Go Google them. They are there as I'm telling them to you. He said, I'm the rightful Pope. And people, of course, did not take him serious, but he did one of the most, most, most notable moves that history will live to remember. One time, again, a group of barbarians, one Attila the Hun, the guy I was talking about, not Hans. And he had another fellow called Alaric. He was a Goth. Same group, big guys, um, brown hair, blue eyes. And these guys get this idea of let's go conquer everywhere. Of course, Rome is prominent. It was the only thing waiting to be conquered. These guys had learned how to conquer. They were crazy. And guess what? Rome, the church, did not have power. Emperors were changed depending on the kings of the kingdoms that were present. Today, it's constant. Another, another one fights for the position, and probably the guy who has fought is the king of Spain. It's, it's so interesting. Eh? 
that the, the emperor thing was clear and unclear sometimes depending on who was emperor and what it was. And at one particular point, it would even lose meaning because, like I said, sometimes certain kingdoms later would become stronger than even certain emperors who were fighting for positions. And some are not even interested in fighting. They just wanted their space because at one particular point it could lose meaning. But for some, it was glory and victory. So long and short, Attila and his friend and Goth come and say, let us attack Rome. They put all their troops outside. Leo, this fellow, comes out, and then he tells nobody should follow me. No gun, no no no, no spear. No, there was no guns then. No spear, no a knife, no nothing. I'm going alone. He goes and faces Attila and his friend Alaric, the Goth, in thousands of army men, and he tells them, "This is the city of God, and I rebuke you. You will not touch it. Go." That boldness shook Attila the Han. I don't know what was in his head and Alaric, and they turned and went. Everybody started to fear Leo. So for some, he's the first pope. <laughs> Praise God. But then also, other people dare an account of the person they call Gregory the First or Gregory the Great. They say Leo was the bold one. Gregory was the man that lived the part. Some believe it's Gregory the guy after. Why? Because Gregory is born of a rich family. He gives all his goods to the poor. And then he goes serving and serving men. And then he, they say in history, that he had a very distinctive fathering spirit. His soul and heart was of a father. He loved men as a father would love his own children. He never held back any of his. He was a giver. He was a lover of men and lived to serve. In fact, the day they ordained him Pope, he wept so much and says, I deserve no position as to be Pope. And he said from today, he refused men, in fact, to call him Pope. And he said from today, call me the servant of the servants of God. That was deep, okay? And so he was well revered because he earned the position by right of how much piety he had toward God, how much commitment he had in the things of God. He was a lover of God, a genuine man of the soul and spirit toward God. Although, unfortunately, he still kept some of those things like the purgatory revelations, the relics, the worship of the saints and those things. But long and short, he was not a very bad guy. Now, that is what leads to the next age, which is called the age of the Christendom, 590 to what we call the Protestant Reformation of 1517. So that means from that time on, papacy takes a stage. And so religion takes another shape as popes are ordained because now popes start to have a certain power and influence on men that is and will amaze us for so many years. All through from 590 into 1500, many things ensued in what we call papacy. That if some of you, I had time to take you through everything, some of you would hate religion to the bone because of how many things happened, how many people died, how many changes took place, and all of them were not for good, and they gave a very, very, very funny picture on what you and I call the faith. But I'll tell you one interesting story. The church, during that time, of course, the papacy has raised also, so you start to see kings with their authorities, but then you start to see also men of authority, like the Pope. And for them, their authority goes beyond kingdoms. He can win a, Christ, a Catholic in Spain and have a Catholic in Mexico and have a Catholic in Italy and have a Catholic everywhere. For you, when you're ruling Germany, you only rule Germany. So you see that the power is starting to change. The influences are starting to change. Now, a very interesting story that I need to read for us, very, very interesting one, begins with a guy they call Clovis I. He was a king. And he was a king of the Franks. Franks, where you have the French, but the Franks were more than just French. Some, they were, Franks was a bigger kingdom, which took partly the Germans and the Russians. It was a bigger kingdom. The Franks were French, were not just French, France, but there were many tribes too. So the king of the Franks, Clovis I, he, is, um, he has established himself as a mighty fellow during that time. Again, one of those experiences where kingdoms are starting to become bigger than others and and, and, and you know, kingdoms are, are shaping up. And then this guy dies and then he leaves his sons, right? That's about um, 
600 something, 50, 40, I mean uh, 78 into that. And then he leaves his sons, uh, but he had not left a clear instruction on who was heir. So these guys start fighting each other. For the good of the Franks, this guy said, you know what, you guys cannot continue fighting each other. This does not work. We need to have a mutual agreement on who should run uh, the government and business of, of the Franks. And then consequently, they created the middle fellow, like you would see the Margaret Thatcher or the, 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 the Churchill Winston or the present who, Brexit lady, who is that? <laughs> yeah, yes. The, the Prime Minister role, for example, in present day Britain, that the Queen and the monarchy are not involved in politics, but these people run the government. So they needed somebody to run the government. And so a certain fellow was ordained. He was called Charles Martel. And they gave him the title of mayor of the palace. They said, you know what, you sons of Clovis, go get certain land somewhere and live there and then leave us to run the government because the Franks must continue being governed. That was the time, in the same time, Islam had just spanned up. These Muslims under Muhammad are going to take over cities and they want to run and fight wherever they can and then subdue them by the sword and then win for Allah. They make a mistake and attack the Franks. During the time when Charles Martel was in charge, he orders the troops well, does a wonderful job, long and short, the Muslims are defeated badly. And after defeating them, what does this fellow do? He becomes prominent. Why? Because he has fought battles for them. His name is sung and sung and sung. And then suggestions come through. By the way, why don't we deal away with the Clovis, Clovis group? And then we begin another dynasty. Through his fellow. And true to form, he lives his life, dies, and then leaves his son called Pippin. Pippin is a, he has an allegiance to Rome even more than his father. And remember, these are very strong kingdoms. Of course, uh, during that time, the emperor, the concept of the emperor has started to die out. Because kingdoms are becoming stronger than emperors and certain kingdoms have what empires have, or close to what empires have. So it's no longer a threat. And some empires are weak and then some popes have gone ahead of the empires and then emperors, the so-called emperors, and some guys are no longer interested to say, you know, that because you have Rome, therefore you have the world. No, it wasn't then so, because certain kingdoms had said to build what Rome had. So the Roman Empire was going into a sort of decimation in that period, and there was nothing so much about the emperors than kingdoms now coming through, and all of them swearing, swearing allegiance to the Catholic Church. So, Pippin, son of of Charles Martel, he, 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 he is submitted. They are simply submitted men to the faith. And so because they're submitted men to the faith, they love the Pope. They, in fact, later on they tell you that he gave some lands of Italy to the Pope because they also had a lot of lands and influence to and fro. And then consequently the family relationship continues so strongly in the land. And then consequently third generational Another fellow comes up after the life of Pippin, comes to the end, which was the son of Pippin and the grandson of Charles Martel, and this guy is called Charles the Great. The French call him Charlemagne, a.k.a. Charlemagne. That fellow is a very important integral name, again, for the Christ syndrome. You see, like you had Constantine, this fellow is important for you to know. If you're talking of liberal Christianity, you're talking of Constantine. If you're talking of the age of a Christendom, you never forget Charlemagne or Charles the Great. Why Charles the Great? Charles the Great comes up and he's a very influential fellow. That was about 700, that's 790 something into 800 AD. See, we're going through there a thousand years. Huh? And he becomes so prominent because he's strong, he's mighty, he has influence, he has everything. And then the Pope starts to look at him as opportunity. He realizes, okay, there is no emperor issue anymore, and the strongest king in Europe is submitted to me spiritually. In fact, he was called by the Pope, he was called the defender of the faith. So what does he do? In 800 AD on Christmas Day, the Pope Leo, second Leo now, gets Charles the Great, Chalamet, brings him before the council and 
puts the crown of him and calls him, ordains him officially the emperor of the resurrected Rome. Boom. Now the papacy is back in place. Why? Because it has ordained another emperor for the whole Roman Empire. Now he's sort of saying, we have ordained him, let us hear anybody say he's not. He has the greatest army, he will kill you. But on the other hand, you owe me, Charles. Why? Because I'm the one who gave you that position by reason of the influences that I have that go past the Franks. So Charles finds himself a bit submitted to, to Rome and, and his emperor. So who is above the emperor? The Pope. You see how powerful that is? You see how powerful that is? And so Charles the Great is there. He did a few great things. He brought moral law and order. He made certain things illegal like gambling and dancing. Charles is known very well for having started the concept of what you and I call schools. He says in the free time of children, free time of young boys, let us create something. Leisure. Leisure is a Latin the, the word scole, which is school. So actually school is the same word as laser. Or well, this is in my laser time. But laser back in the day was actually school, right? And so they said in the free time of these children, let us teach them to read, let us teach them to write, and let us teach them arith arithmetic. But only boys. So girls in Charlemagne's time were only there to get married to educated boys. Praise God. Um... He dies also later, and his kingdom is divided exactly the, the same way Clovis's was. You know, the whole history repeats itself. Clovis's kingdom became his exact way. Charlemagne's kingdom, what? Became. And so he dies, and when he dies, the sons also start fighting for power. Remember, there's an old Clovis group. Now there's this group later of this generation of more than 100 years later. Splits are coming through, divisions are coming through. And then who takes what, who takes what, and then who is loyal to who and who is loyal to who. So now everybody gets into disarray and then men get into the mind of let us, each one of us start fighting for our spaces. Right? Because the leadership is frustrated. Let, can we, whoever is strong and can get crazy fellows behind them to fight, then let's get guys to fight. And before you know that, certain people, if for example, Pastor Zach has 100 people, 300 people who are his friends, he tells them, you know what, let's go around, uh, uh, you know, Kayunga. They kill a few who, is, who get away from here, I own this land, he becomes a land lord. So that is the time we start to see men fighting for lands, and then lands were, and properties were not in the hands of kingdoms anymore, but individuals started to fight for spaces. Are you following what I'm saying? The individuals start to what? Fight for spaces. So, we start to see a situation where, um, of course, there is an idea of the kingdom, but it has lost strength. It has lost a certain what? Influence. It has lost a certain power. It has lost a certain glory. It has lost a certain... Yes, thank you very much. And so what happens? You have what you call the landlords, the landladies, the serfs, the knights, the castles. So a landlord were rich people because they controlled lands, right? And in there, because they were the lords of the lands, they built castles. And in the castles, they had knights to protect them. And then they had serfs that served on their Yes, and so that's where the concept of Lord, Lady, so and so comes through. You see where it comes from? You own something, not just finding you on the street and say, excuse me, lady, no. <laughs> then, <laughs> it meant that you what? <laughs> you own what? You own something. So, um, now if you're living on my land, you have to pay. To live on my land because I need income. Okay? You need to be accountable to me. I own you. If I don't own you, then look for another landlord. Okay? So rules are passed. For example, 
that if you're under my land, you have to pay to, to live on my land. You have to till my land. You have to give me a certain amount of money every year. You have to look after my animals. And you have to commit yourself to fighting for me 40 days a year in case I have war. For example, if we have enemies in the West, we get 200 landlords and we tell them, get all the guys on your property. Let them get uh, spears. And then they all have to fight in the name of, if you don't want, go look for another landlord. What do you do? You sign. You see what I'm saying? So what happens then, consequently, we start to see uh, the concept of feudalism. The word feud means to pay. To pay yourself into something, to allow yourself to, 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 to get that. And in something, I have a soul, praise God. Some of you know what I mean in the, in, 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 in the Baganda. So now another problem is coming through. Why? What about the churches on these lands? What are they going to do? If you're a church on the land, what are you to do? Okay, yes. You have to pay me because I'm the landowner. More than that now, this even go, becomes more wicked and radical. The landlords are like, no. <laughs> if that church is there, it's mine. <laughs> right? And then that's the concept, like Hans was saying, where we start to see concepts like Simon, he comes through. Simon, he comes from the book of Acts. You remember Simon the Sosara, who was willing to pay for the Holy Spirit to come on him, who was willing to give money. So we start to see religious leaders in some of these landlord areas pay bribes and money to be kept in positions as leaders of these churches because then churches were looked at sources of income. If you lost the church, you lost fees. Praise God. Because they were looked at as sources of what? And it's like that these days. <laughs> churches are like sources of income. Okay. So anyway, and then we see the idea of nepotism coming through. How relatives being put in political positions and, you know, church positions. Because the landlord says, you know what, you're my son, you're a good preacher. This priest in the church down the road, why don't you replace him? Why? Because it's a business. You understand what I'm saying? Indulgences are coming in, money is coming in. It becomes so ugly. It becomes so what? So ugly. Praise God. Now... It continues like that. What do you think is happening? It's brewing. Some people are getting tired. One of the people who should be getting tired, of course, are the monks. The monasteries are getting crazy. And then one day, they wake up and in about 900 AD and they say, this one, whether you're killing us, doing anything to us, kill us if you want. We are not going to pay any more ground taxes. Kill us if you want. More than 300 monasteries. They said we're not going to pay because I said every time men are pushed on pressure, two things will, will take place. Either reformation will take place or a revolution. If you cannot change the right way, we will fight. Praise God. And so, of course, some wars took place during that time. And feudal lords were fighting people who had refused to pay. Many lives, many lives were claimed in that period. Are you following what I'm saying? Now, we go from the 900s into the 10 hundreds. There's a fellow called Gregory the seventh, the early 10 hundreds. There's a, a pope called Gregory the seventh. He realizes that, you know, it's too much. He also has to be hero. What should he do? He says, you know what? As a pope, I'm going to fight simony, nepotism, and all these things. But he's not fighting the churches and the systems that get the money. He's just saying this time when the money is coming, don't put your relatives there or don't pay for the position. Let the God somehow put you there. Isn't that funny? So anyway, he's fighting Simon and what nepotism, but not how the money is flowing in the church. And then he accuses one fellow who was the king of German then, Henry the Fourth. And he tells him, Henry, we have found that you have been a practice of simony. You pay to get certain people in certain positions of the office such that as those positions come through, money also comes through. Simon Henry says, no, no. Gregory says, it's true, and we are going to deal with you. Henry says, what do you mean? He says, come. Henry tells the guy, so you come. Because I'm also a sovereign king of my nation. Who are you, Pope, to command me? And then there's a standstill. 
The Pope Gregory interdicted him. What does it mean to interdict? He cut him off. He excommunicated him. And then he passed the law to all the churches in Germany and said, no Holy Communion in Germany. Now, you must understand, you guys think, Holy Communion in Germany was not just something you eat. Because the Roman Catholic Church had convinced men that Holy Communion was the real blood and the body. If you don't eat the blood and you don't eat the body of Jesus Christ, you are gone. Your foot a cast on your children. Anything that befalls German, it is because of that. The uproar was not a small one. People started, Henry, why are you killing your people? Why are you landing us in trouble? Why did you do this to the Pope? Do you love us? Do you know we can even oust you and then we are going to fight you off the throne? Now he's a threatened man because he realizes that he has beaten more than he was able to chew. The Pope had power. They had convinced guys that eating Holy Communion, oh, oh, don't even joke with it. If you don't eat it, so he says, you eating Holy, oh, 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 oh don't joke with that thing. It, eh, eh, eh. So Henry realizes he was going to lose everything, going to lose his everything, and then he has to go to Gregory. Gregory also now, that was the day the papacy discovered another weapon. So what does he do? He treats him like a child puts him outside in the cold snow for three days, it is written. The man was in the cold snow for three days as an act of penance. So I said, Gregory would forgive him, least the whole of Germany and his whole family perish. He stayed there for three days and then forgive him. From that day, Rome realized it did not need guns. It also had the tongue of the Pope. You will see through the 1000s, 1100s, 1300s, and 1112s, 1300s, you're going to see the papacy have a certain power. They fear to be cast by the Pope. If the Pope cast you, if the Pope told France and Germany and Holland to attack you tomorrow, they will attack you. Because you've touched who? You've touched the Pope. In fact, one Pope, I think it was Boniface the Eighth, he said in the 1300s, I am the Caesar. My God, popes became bigger than emperors. You understand what I'm saying? And so that is now again worsening on the side of how the church is looking like. And consequently, the indulgences continue. The clergy have become mediators between man and God. So they are saying, you know what? We know Jesus is the mediator between man and God. And I, the Pope, I am the mediator between Christ and the church, Vicarius Philippe, the representative of Christ on earth. Like, I'm mean, here, Christ is here, God is there. So God has to go through Christ and then Christ through me. So even the acts of worship, the simple things like Holy Communion, they were taken differently. That's why in the Roman Catholic Church, you remember, the bread was put on your mouth. You didn't have even a righteousness <laughs> to touch it. And you are not supposed to bite the body. You are supposed to let it dissolve in your mouth. Who remembers what I'm trying to tell you? <laughs> if it's extra, it's only impendent on me not to give extra. If it's extra, it's only because I, as the priest, I have to take more of the body. Everything comes from me to you. If I don't give you, you don't eat. And if I don't eat, you're going to die. He says some fall sick and are dying. They quote the scripture. They tell you, That's why you have cancer in your body. Because you're not having Holy Communion from the priest. Even a ring was special during that time. If you kiss it, you can redeem yourself from a thousand curses. <laughs> Praise God. That was what? <laughs> that was the age of the Christ and Doom. Praise God.